Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Troy Moon. I'm the Director of Sustainability for the City of Portland, and I'd like to welcome you to our September edition of Coffee and Climate, which is a monthly event coordinated uh, jointly by the City of Portland Sustainability Office and the South Portland Sustainability Office. So together, we're working to implement One Climate Future, which is the climate action plan adopted by both of our cities. If you'd like to learn more about One Climate Future, we welcome you to visit our website, which is oneclimatefuture.org. And while you're there, sign up for our monthly newsletter so you can keep up to date about the goings on of our One Climate Future team and hear about future coffee and climates. Um, and you also can view previous editions of Coffee and Climate while you're there. Uh, we are so happy to have you here today. Um, but before we get started, a few quick introductions. Uh, we're joined today uh, by Julie Rosenbach, who is our colleague. She's the Director of Sustainability for the City of South Portland. And we're joined also by my colleagues in the Portland office, Aaron uh, Farrell and Katie Timms. Um, we're also, we'd also like to welcome Councillor um, Anna Bullitt, who is um, a member of the Portland City Council and a member of our Sustainability and Transportation Committee. Welcome, Councillor Bullitt, this morning. And I also want to give special recognition to two wonderful people who have been working with us for the past, uh, since January, Kaylee Weeks and Jenna Darcy. Um, they have been serving as our Resilience Corps members. Kaylee has been in the Portland office and Jenna has been in the South Portland office. And they have done some wonderful projects for us. Uh, and their, um, this is their last, last coffee and climate of the year. And they're finishing up their work terms at the end of September. And again, we'd like to appreciate all of the hard work that both Kaylee and Jenna have done for um, sustainability in Portland and South Portland. And we wish them well on their next adventures and, and truly appreciate all of the hard work they have done while they've been with us for the past nine months. So thank you again, uh, Kaylee and Jenna. And now uh, I want to pass uh, the proceedings over to Katie Timms, who was our lead organizer uh, for this event and did lots of work to pull this together. And so uh, Katie, if you could take it away and, and introduce our special guest today. Yeah, happily. Um, um, I would like to introduce our guest speaker today, um, Dr. Narav Shah. Um, you may be familiar with Dr. Shah from his previous role serving as the director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which is our state's public health agency. Um, and during this time when he served with Maine, he led our state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and became just such a source of comfort and really critical knowledge to Mainers as we um, fought the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and in 2023, Dr. Shaw was appointed to the Principal Deputy Director of the US CDC and is now our second highest ranking official in the US CDC. So we are very lucky today to have him join us. Um, so please welcome me and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Narav Shah as the guest speaker for today's Coffee and Climate. Great. Well, thank you, Katie, and good morning, everyone. It is great to see so many folks, uh, many old friends uh, this morning. I'm really delighted and honored to be asked to join and um, really excited to spend some time with everybody today. What I'd, what I'd like to do is, uh, is spend about 10 minutes or so laying out where we are with respect to the, to the nexus of climate change, public health, uh, and as well as the communication around climate change and public health, but then spend the balance of our time discussing the issues uh, and, and taking any questions that you might have on that. Um, as, as you all know, from years of being on Zooms, uh, 45 minutes of someone just talking is not, uh, is not particularly engaging. So I'll try to set the table uh, and then we can see where we go uh, with subsequent discussion. And, and what I'd like to do is, is just that, which is to talk about two things. One is slightly more scientific issues around the interplay between climate change and public health and why that nexus matters, but then talk about what we know about talking about climate change and public health and what works, what doesn't work, and why that piece of the equation is also critically important. So at a high level, let's start by enumerating some of the ways in which climate change can, will, and already has affected public health. Now, the one that is the most evident because it's built into the name is high heat. Um, high temperatures themselves are probably one of the most distinct 
concerns as we think about climate change. Now, I know that for folks in the Northeast back home, it, it, it may seem a bit odd to talk about heat as a threat, but even in the context of Maine, high heat is a particularly pronounced threat. Uh, the percentage of folks in Maine who have air conditioning in their home, depending on what survey you look at, is still significantly below the national average for reasons that are very obvious for everyone back home. Um, and so that alone means that even a slight increase in temperatures puts Maine at a disadvantage relative to places where air conditioning is a lot more prevalent. To say nothing of the fact that just by virtue of the historically colder climate, grappling with hotter climates is very difficult and can take a long time uh, to, to adapt to. So right off the bat, one of the most pressing areas of concern for climate change and public health has been around high heat. And the numbers bear that out. Uh, nationwide, high heat causes more deaths than any other kind of weather event. And right now, high heat is the most pressing issue, again, at the intersection of climate change and public health. Now, what I will note is, is not just the heat itself, but the equity concerns around that. It's not just that it's getting hotter. It's that the brunt of who bears the cost of it getting hotter, the physical cost, the financial cost of it getting hotter, is not spread evenly across society. And so sadly, like so many other things, those who are the least able to cope ha happen also to be those who are at the highest risk level, the elderly, for example, those who are of lower socioeconomic means. And so there's a distinct equity lens through which we have to view everything related to climate change and public health. Heat is a good example of that. Let me turn next to another area that comes to mind for a lot of folks when you talk about climate change and public health, and that's infectious diseases. And Maine is not, has not escaped that piece. Tick-borne illnesses are on the rise. And tick-borne illnesses that previously only existed in much warmer climates are finding their way into the Northeast. For example, a tick called the Lone Star Tick has started to be found in the Northeast. To say nothing of increasing rates of other tick-borne diseases. For example, the Lone Star Tick adds to the much more common deer tick that we all know very well in Maine because that's what carries Lyme disease. It's not just ticks though, I mean, ticks are the worst, but there are other vectors that are also increasing in number and spread as climate change increases. Mosquito-borne illnesses are very much on the rise. And though not yet distinctly in Maine, although it could find its way there, more nationally, we're keeping a close eye on fungal diseases. Um, there have been a couple that have been detected in the Northeast already, but in other parts of the country, in the Southwest and the Northwest, fungal-based diseases that previously only occurred in small numbers are exploding. And this is all a function, not, not entirely, I'm sorry, not entirely a function of climate change, as I'll talk about in a bit, but in part a function of climate change. The third area I wanted to zero in on is natural disasters and injuries. Um, in 2023, we saw the most number of $1 billion disasters ever. We don't have the numbers in for 2024, but you can surmise that that trend is not one that's going to get better over time. You know, in, 2020, in 2023, there were 25 natural disasters. That's up from seven natural disasters that happened in 2022. And again, 23 shaped up to be the warmest year on record. We don't have all the data for 2024, but again, that's not likely to be a trend that reverses itself. And I think as all of you have seen in the press, it seems like every single month is the hottest month ever on record. I haven't checked the data for, uh, for August yet, uh, but that's a trend that we've seen continuing into 2024. So this nexus of of climate change causing more natural disasters is something that's already been seen and felt in Maine, the floods that have already happened, um, it, to say nothing of what I'm going to talk about next, which is wildfires. So all of these things are happening. And what we're going to talk about at the end of this is what do we do? But just to foreshadow that, 
There are two general strategies as we think about climate change and particularly around health. One is to try to reverse climate change itself, which is a laudable goal and one that we should be focused on, bringing down CO2 emissions, so on and so forth. But we also have an imperative to mitigate and adapt to the fact that climate change is happening. And, I, and you've seen in Governor Mills' work, work to shore up our coastal communities, to steal them against the possibility of more flooding, things of that nature. Next, and then I'll start wrapping up here. Uh, I mentioned this a moment ago, but another distinct area between climate change and health is with respect to air quality, wildfires, and wildfire smoke. Now, we usually think of wildfire smoke, which is right now plaguing the West Coast. It's affected Maine uh, last summer as well. We usually think of damage from air quality and wildfire smoke as something that just affects the lungs. Uh, but sadly, the effects and the impacts of air pollution can damage just about every system in the body. They're incredibly difficult on the heart. They can even infect, they can even affect cognition, uh, so on and so forth. And so as we learn more about what chronic repeated inhalation of wildfire smoke does, it raises the imperative to make sure we're taking control of that issue. And then finally, something that is not as well discussed, um, but I think is just as important as the physical manifestations that I talked about, uh, are the impacts of climate change on mental health. Now, this has been something that's been studied on the global sphere as well as uh, domestically. And it will surprise no one that particularly younger folks are uneasy about what the future of climate change means for their future. Um, you know, uh, un unfortunately for many younger folks, um, even though it may be the hottest summer of our lives, it may be the coolest summer of their lives. And contending with that is something that raises a lot of anxiety and it's been well documented. Now this dovetails into what communication can do here. And this is where I'll wrap up. Simply put, as much as the science about climate change and public health are critical to understand because they galvanize us to action, how we communicate about climate change is just as important. And again, we can talk more about this, but here's what I'll say. Um, science, data, facts only go so far in changing people's minds, let alone spurring them to action. It is rare that a, a, a book of scientific statistics or data uh, is even read, let alone digested in a manner where people say, holy cow, I am now gonna take action on this. So if it's not data and facts that spur people to change their minds and take action, what is it? Well, I think fundamentally it's about stories. And what we need is to make people and their stories the face of climate change, not data and statistics. The data and the statistics back up those stories. They make those stories more generally applicable, but it's the stories themselves, the stories about the impact of climate change, stories about resilience after weather events, and stories about people innovating and taking control of the situation rather than letting it happen to them that will ultimately be what galvanizes people to action. Fundamentally, grappling with climate change is about management and leadership. It's partly about knowing the science, it's partly about telling the story, but fundamentally it's about management and leadership. And that's why I'm so delighted to learn that Portland and South Portland, to say nothing of Governor Mills and her team at the state level, have decided to take strong action against climate change, to take control of the situation now, rather than when it's too late, when we're trying to dig ourselves out of that challenge. So now is certainly the time to act how we act and the leadership through which we act are going to be critical for the next part. So with that, Katie, I will wrap things up and turn it back over to you for questions, observations, and discussion. So Kate, thank, thanks, Dr. Shah. Before we pass it for back sure. to Katie for um, some q and I just also want to welcome Councillor Regina Phillips, who is also a member of our Sustainability and Transportation Committee here in Portland. And you know, again, thank you for joining us, um, Councillor. And Katie, um, if you want to moderate our Q&A, um, please take it away now. Happily. Um, thank you, Dr. Shaw. That was, I think, a fantastic kind of context, but also a call to action and more of a hopeful lens of looking at it, too. 
Um, cause yeah, these conversations can be scary, but I think, yeah, we all, we all can tell our story and think about the ways that we're moving forward in this future. Um, I'm inviting folks to ask their questions, um, tell their story. Do you see a hand? I know I actually have a question. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned something about um, the fungal diseases, and I guess I hadn't heard much about that as a new kind of consequence of climate change. I want, yeah, could you speak a little yeah. more on that? Well, well, by all means, you know, nowadays we're so accustomed to hearing of viruses, whether it's Tripoli yeah. or uh, you know, uh, West Nile in the Midwest, uh, as well as in the nor Northeast, to say nothing of other viruses that we've all contended with. Uh, but it's important to note that fungal diseases are actually a really big area of concern. Uh, there are two that I'll mention really quickly. Uh, one, is a, one is a disease called Candida. Candida auris is the name of it, and perhaps folks have heard about it. It exploded around the globe a number of years ago. And um, it is thought that that explosion was in part related to climate change, not exclusively, which is what makes this entire thing difficult. Nothing here is a one-to-one -one relationship, a direct cause and effect. But Candida or C. auris uh, seems to have adapted or been selected for uh, because of a rising climate to be able to better adapt to live inside people. And that is not good for us, even if it's good for them. Um, and as a result of that, it has found its way into healthcare settings and nursing homes and has caused an immense amount of harm. Uh, and so that is a significant issue that is being contended with. The other, and I, I sort of referenced this, is a disease called valley fever which again, historically has been rather limited to the Southwest part of the United States, but in part because of climate change and this same sort of adaptation, we've now seen it explode in the Southwest, well, and explode is overstating it, increase in the Southwest, but also find its home in different parts of the country, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. Now, it hasn't, if I, it hasn't found itself to New England yet, but as we've learned with each and every one of these, we can't be complacent and say, oh, well, that's a problem that affects people in Seattle, or that's a problem that affects people in Albuquerque. We're good up here. That would be the absolute wrong lesson to take from the history of climate change and infectious disease threats. The right lesson is that as the climate in the Northeast continues to inch higher, the likelihood that diseases that were not able to get a foothold previously will find their way there. What are we doing now to get on top of that problem before it arises rather than after it gets there, which in, when it comes to diseases is usually too late? That was some helpful information. Um, I see Councillor Bullitt, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Shaw, a delightful good, to, good see to see you. Good and, to see you too. Uh, Dr. Shaw and I go way back to like day three on the job, right? Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly it. Um, back, I have, at the, uh, back at the, um, um, the expo. Uh, exactly, the expo. Um, one thing I did want to let you know is that we, the Portland Water District is actually testing for C. Oris. Um, but I do, I guess, have a question. Obviously, that's reactionary because that's for monitoring purposes, um, but would love to know. I have two questions. So my first question is I would love to know if there's preventative measures um, for Cioris. And then my other question, and this is because I was just at a public housing um, ribbon cutting ceremony, and this public housing, just to build it, had about 12 different funding streams. Um, and so they were only able to put cooling systems in one of the units and they or not units, but one of the buildings and they put it in the 55 plus, which makes a lot of sense. Um, it also has really cool things like um, outlets connected to for medical devices that are connected to a generator, which is cool. But these other buildings don't have cooling. And so I'm wondering if there might be federal money coming like more from the public health side as opposed to from the housing side. Um, because we know that this is a life-saving measure now, making sure there's cooling, not just for housing 
developments, but also for prisons. I would love to hear about any plans to force prison contractors to install cooling um, if they want the contract for their prison, because we know that the uptick in deaths from extreme heat in the prison system has been really, really bad the past couple of years. So those are my two questions. Thanks. Great. Great. Thanks, Anna. So first on um, preventative measures for Sea Oris, there, there are a host of preventative measures. They are usually operationalized at the institutional level, at the healthcare facility level, where there is a laundry list of items that the CDC recommends that any kind of healthcare facility, be it a hospital or nursing home, et cetera, undertake to guard against the introduction of Sea Oris. Once it gets into a facility, it is an extremely hardy organism and difficult to eradicate from within a facility. Um, and, and so the goal here is to keep it at bay as much as possible. Kudos to the water district for testing for it. That's helpful at least to know what's coming down the pike and may raise the concern level among healthcare facilities to double down on their preventive efforts. Um, on the infrastructure piece, um, I can't speak for the Bureau of Prisons as to what they may be doing on their contracts. Um, we at the CDC, we don't, we, we don't give out grants for things of that nature. So it's not something in the offing for us. I really do think that would be a HUD um, type of play uh, rather than something from HHS, just based on how we fund things. We don't really fund uh, uh, physical infrastructure or things of that nature, whereas that would be more HUD or perhaps uh, an another associated agency. It's a good question is the bottom line, um, because as you say, it's it's more than just infrastructure now. It, it's getting to the point where it's it, it's just as essential as other parts of the physical building, whether it's the electrical outlets or the plumbing. And so it's a good question. Uh, I don't have a great answer in terms of what's coming down the pike, but I, I like the idea. Um, let, let me just say this. Um, when, we, when we think about climate action, particularly as it relates to things like air conditioning, uh, the, the, the key here is to get folks to take climate action without necessarily billing it as a climate initiative. And so heat pumps are a really good idea uh, in that respect, or a good case study, because they are at the intersection of good climate action, something that's comfortable and something that makes good economic sense relative to air conditioning or burning fuel oil. And so, but you know, heat pumps are not really framed as, hey, do your part for the climate, get a heat pump. It's, hey, lower your electricity bill, get a heat pump. And, and that's how, when we talk about stories and framing, um, that's how we need to be thinking about things. Not so much about, hey, you need to do your part for the environment. Some people will indeed be motivated by that, but not everybody. And we're not in a world right now where we can just be marketing toward 20% of the population. It's got to be more broad. And that's going to be what hits people in their comfort zone, literally, and in their pocketbook. Thank you for that. And I see Julie has her hand up. Well, uh, uh, thank you, um, Councillor Bullitt, because um, I have a very similar question. Um, um, so we have been working a lot on incentivizing air source heat pumps um, and other electrified um, uh, strategies for, for residents um, in order to promote the cooling aspect of things and lower bills and just electrify buildings so that they can be um, um, uh, use less carbon. So here's my question. In the meantime, as we work on this, um, I know South Portland has cooling centers. And what I've heard from our um, fire and EMT is that people don't use them because people have a hard time considering it's, um, um, heat is sort of a little bit more insidious. It inches up and it inches up and people feel uncomfortable, but um, they don't understand that it's an emergency until it's too late. And I just wonder if, um, if you've seen that in other places and um, have any story or narrative that can help um, um, it, uh, encourage people um, I, 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 I'm not a fan of putting more money into cooling centers. I would rather use that money to decentralize the cooling and put it where people need it. But, but while we're doing that transition, I just wonder if you have any advice on the story or the narrative around driving people to cooling centers before. Huh. Um, it um, you know, that, okay. Th thank you. That is a really interesting question. And I'm, I'm not, I don't have a great 
answer, but I, I, I really like the question. And so this is a task for me to get a better answer that I can use uh, and perhaps convey back to you. But here's, um, so this is very interesting because I too have had, I don't want to call them concerns, that's grossly overstating it, but I've, I've wondered about cooling centers, uh, not from the vantage point that you noted, which is the, the creep, the slow creep of heat, but rather the transport concern. Uh, um, folks don't have an easy way to get there. We saw the same with warming centers as well. And so I've, I've often wondered how we bridge that gap. But you raise uh, an equally vexing and important issue, which is how to convince folks that the time to go to a cooling center is actually long before you're overheating. Um, and so I, I, I don't have a, a, a narrative that explains why. Um, there, there's, there's really interesting data uh, going all the way back to um, a really awful heat wave in the city of Chicago in 1995 that claimed the lives of a lot of people. It's been studied by epidemiologists. Uh, that's where the, the, the equity point that I made a moment ago kind of came out of that experience. Um, but I, the, here's the, uh, yeah, again, I, I really like the question because I, I, I need to have a, we, we all need to have a narrative for why this matters. The other, the other point, uh, Julie, and this connects a bit with Anna's question too, is um, uh, we, we often somewhat reflexively conclude that the worst effects of heat will be borne by the elderly. And, and that, that is indeed the case. However, um, in, in the recent year or two, my, my team here has briefed me on the significant impact of high heat on kids. Uh, there, there has been this idea that I admit that I maybe had fallen into, which is, oh, kids are resilient. They can deal with a lot. They, uh, it turns out that is not the case. Their bodies are not really well equipped to, to thermoregulate, so on and so forth. And, and so, um, you know, so here you have individuals at the most vulnerable spectrums of life, the young and the, and the older, who are uniquely uh, susceptible to high heat. Um, and so how do we convince or convey to folks that before it hits 100 degrees, that's when you need to be in a cooling center? I'm, again, as you can tell, I, I'm, I need to, this is homework for me to get sharper on. So I really appreciate your question. You raise then, and I'll conclude, you raise a very interesting policy issue, which is centralized versus decentralized approaches to keeping folks cool. Um, I don't know the answer because on one hand, you you might think, okay, uh, shepherding folks to a school gymnasium is maybe a lot more efficient on the hottest days um, rather than individual wall units or uh, window units, which probably consume a lot of electricity. Um, although at the same time, if, if a lot of the most vulnerable are not going to the school gym. Um, so I again, I, I really appreciate your question. I, I don't have a great set of insights for it but this is a good flag for me to go back to my team and learn more. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like we, we all keep learning more. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I see Solange, you have your hand up. You might have to unmute yourself quickly. We all do it, no worries. <laughs> Happens too often. Uh, given that no two main winters are the same, uh, I felt like this past winter was not a typical one. And I'm wondering, we've talked a lot about summer and heat, but I'm wondering about the effect of uh, a warming planet on winter and vectors. Uh, can you talk about that? Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the science and then I'm gonna veer a little bit into science fiction, just a little bit. So let's start with the actual science and then we'll get into the, the realm of speculation a little bit. Um, so on, on the actual science side, yes. I mean, the, the fact that there's not as much condensed precipitation, snow, uh, rather rain and such is definitely having an impact across the country uh, and in Maine with more flooding, more soil erosion in the winter, things of that sort. Um, I don't wanna understate the economic impact, even though we're talking about health, but the economic impact of that shift is also notable. Not the focus of today, but an important consideration. Um, more generally, the, the warming in the coldest months has broader impacts, things that we've all read about, 
for example, with um, with great glacial melting, increasing uh, the, the, the water levels, things of that nature. I, I won't go too much into that, but yes, the warmer winters are a significant factor that's dry, that's going to be driving a lot of of the overall shift in weather patterns. So the warmer winter then sets us up for an even warmer summer, uh, for example, and then that sets us up for a worse mosquito season. What I mean by that is it's often the deep hard frost of a winter that lowers mosquito levels and tick levels. But if that's not the case, if the overwintering uh, is occurring at a higher rate, rather than something that drops because of the cold temperatures, then come the spring, all of those species are ready to go with greater ferocity and thus a higher level of the diseases that we've already talked about. And so that's a, that's a cycle that we've already seen. Let me veer just again ever so slightly now into the realm of science fiction. And this is a set of concerns, some of which have started to accumulate some evidence some remain speculative, but a set of concerns that's rooted in the fear that melting of very deep sheets of ice, whether in the north or in Russia and elsewhere, may dislodge or reveal bacteria and viruses that had laid dormant for hundreds upon hundreds of years. Bacteria and viruses that we may not have any degree of immunity to. Uh, we may not be familiar with them. And so there is this concern. And again, I want to stress it's largely in the realm of science fiction and hypothesis rather than something you need to stay awake at night tonight worrying about. But it's a concern that if enough of the winter ice melts, it may reveal organisms that we have not seen, our bodies have not seen in many, many hundreds of years. And it may be a threat that comes at us very quickly as a result of that. We're not there, but that's the sort of thing that we've got scientists who are thinking about. Wowza. Um, Solange, if you, yeah, if that answered your question, um, I'd ask you to put your, or de-raise your hand. Um, and I see Orion has a question. That was fine. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking about your answer and the question about warming centers and also heat pumps you know the marketing of the heat pumps is for a different reason than the climate reason maybe the marketing for the for the cooling centers is the same in that if you market as this is a video game tournament for kids or a board game tournament or uh, a reading you know day where seniors and kids come and seniors read to kids like then it gives them something to do and they don't feel like they're a victim that needs to be protected. This is a fun opportunity to come. And likewise, if you market just to the people who you think are in need of the cooling center, maybe the marketing is, hey, do you know a senior who uh, doesn't have AC? Give them a ride to the cooling center. And then you're addressing transportation and you have other people who are talking to their neighbors about going to the heating center instead of the person making that initiative themselves. I, I, I love that. I, I love both of those. Uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will tell you what one draw for family members of mine to go to cooling centers, one hook that always gets my very frugal family members in the door is don't spend money on a hot day, go to a cooling center and let someone else pick up the tab. Uh, and that's, again, for my very frugal family, is something that almost always gets them in the door. Uh, but I like both of the other sets of ideas. Now, I've, I've certainly seen that give someone a ride uh, elsewhere in the country. And I think even in the winter in Maine, we did that with heating centers, but I, I don't want to misspeak. But I, I also like the uh, sort of make it an event, uh, particularly on the hottest days. Um, I like that a lot. That's a great example. It's, I mean, a lot of a lot of climate adaptation is going to be a part about the science that I've mentioned, but it's going to be a lot about the marketing of this. Um, and and I don't I don't I say that not to minimize or trivialize it. That's not the intention, but it is a recognition that a lot of what we talk about when we talk about climate change is getting folks to change their behavioral patterns, even in really small ways. 
And scientists, let's face it, we're not good at that, right? We don't, we don't, we don't know how to get people to change behavior. That's not what we do. Um, who does that really well? It's folks that, that understand why people do the things they do and what hooks will get them to, to move in the right direction to take care of themselves. I completely agree. And I, Ryan, I think that's some fantastic points too. I think getting neighbors to help each other too, or um, interacting with new members of your community um, is just an added benefit of our fight against climate change and adapting. So I think, I think those were brilliant points. Um, I, and if that answers the question, I see Barry, you have your hand up next. And I think you're muted. I think you're still muted. Why don't we go to Pamela? We'll come right back to you, Barry. Pamela, you're up next. Hi, thank you for um, taking my question. And thank you, Dr. Shaw, for taking time to speak to us again today in Maine. We lo I love it. Um, I have a, a question. Um, I love your idea about how the people's stories and I just don't know, uh, I, I think here in South Portland, um, we lost the shacks on Willard Beach and um, we can't rebuild them because of a, lots of factors. But I just don't, I think it's a great story to see that it's gone. And I just don't know if anybody looked into the, could they be um, rebuilt on higher, uh, like on um, like pillars um, up higher and show where it used to be and where it's gonna be, where the sea level's gonna be. And it's a piece of artwork. Um, so not the same thing. And I know Dr. Shaw, this isn't for you to answer, but if, if the one one um, climate future could start talking about, maybe we could put that, what, cause that like opens up all sorts of discussion and people can, um, a lot of naysayers would be like, they're confronted with the, with the visual. And I just wanted to put that out. Thank you. Thank you. I, I did read about that uh, and it, you know, it, was, it was saddening. And those are the sorts of visuals, as you say, that, that spur people to action. Um, you know, I, I will tell you, when I was, when I was growing up, the, the, the symbol of climate change, for, for me at least as I remember it, the symbol of climate change was unforgettable. I think it's a visual that all of us remember, which was the polar bear. And the polar bear is what was held out as the archetype of what was happening with climate change, particularly the, 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 the ragged, haggard looking polar bear, uh, a far cry from what we had come to see in commercials and such. Uh, and, and there was some benefit to that, but I, I also um, fear that it actually minimized the impact of what was happening um, from a visual perspective, because again, a lot of folks default to thinking of polar bears uh, in, 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 as we see in animated commercials. Um, but either way, the, the symbol of climate change now is not the polar bear, it, it's us, right? It's those visuals of our, the things that we used to do and enjoy that are literally being burned or swept away uh, or things of that nature or individuals in hospitals with infections that perhaps would not have occurred many years ago, but for climate change. So we are very much the visual now for climate change and public health. Um, that's depressing, uh, but it also is important because when we think about climate change, discussions about health and the health impact are perhaps the most useful vehicle to get folks focused on climate change overall. Um, it, it's, it's, it's hard to get folks focused on climate change and economic development. It's, it's abstract, et cetera. But we all can appreciate the impact of climate change on heat, infectious diseases, wildfires. And so it's a useful and important shell vehicle through which to talk more broadly about climate change. And, and that's one reason we're talking about it here today. Spot on. Um, and yeah, Barry. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah, yeah, my laptop issues. I have to put this thing on. Um, 
Dr. Shaw, your voice is so familiar and to actually be able to talk to you is such a privilege. You mentioned behavior, I've taken some notes. You've mentioned behavioral patterns are hard to change. And my first career was as a clinical dietitian and I was not a good fit for a hospital and changing people's eating habits was quite challenging. Um, one of the most powerful things people can do for both personal health and climate is changing diet. And that is improving diet, increasing vegetables. I've been whole food plant-based um, in Michael Greger's inspiration for over 10 years. And the health transformation is amazing. And how agriculture affects the carbon footprint is huge. And to encourage people to both improve their diet and eat more locally, decrease animal products. It's the one thing that you can do if you can't afford an electric car or if you can't afford to put in the heat pumps this year or something. It's powerful action. And I know I have lots of conversations with people and I'm not always very well received. So I understand the challenge of this, but I'm so happy to just put that out to you and your thoughts. Well, first of all, thank you uh, for, for the kind words uh, and to both you and, and Pamela. Um, again, it's great to be back. I, um, it's a, a, a love, uh, love reconnecting with folks back in Maine. Um, and you, you make a really important point. I, I, I didn't touch on that, and I'm glad that you raised it for that exact reason. Um, you're right. I mean, um, it, with, it seems like um, every month there's a new paper or article that documents the direct and indirect effects uh, of various levels of factory farming, high degrees of meat consumption on both our environment and I will say increasingly on our infectious disease landscape. Uh, a, a large part of the work that I do at the CDC is around our responses to infectious diseases. And increasingly what we are seeing is um, an erosion or, or, or a set of changes that are happening that are significantly increasing the risk of infectious diseases, uh, in part because of farming practices. Uh, and so we're seeing instances of infectious diseases that previously only existed in animals that are jumping over to humans with some degree of regularity. That's happening right now with an ongoing outbreak in the United States uh, related to avian influenza. And that is in part because of the structure of large scale factory farming. Um, mm -hmm. To say nothing of what's happening in other parts of the world as well. So in addition to some of the health benefits that you noted, in addition to the reduction in carbon generation and emission, um, this concern about infectious diseases uh, because of the increasing interaction between animals and humans is also a concern that's on the horizon. And so I'm, I'm glad you raised it. it it's, I, you know, I, I, it's very much on my mind. It's something that my own family and I have, I think similar to you, have taken steps in the direction of, partly for health reasons, but also for some of the other reasons you mentioned. Yeah, thank you. I know my personal immunity is huge and my inflammation factor is really low. And that's contributed to a lot of health benefits that, um, you know, at my age, it makes a huge difference. So thank you for following up on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barry. Um, and Troy, I see you have your hand up. Do um, a couple of questions, uh, Dr. Shaw. So the first one has to do with what type of um, training or education are public health professionals and um, doctors getting related to um, you know climate change and impacts of climate change and how their practice can can help their um, patients in that regard. And the second part of that question is um, you know in a lot of our a lot of our agencies are really siloed. How, do you have any thoughts about how we can work more collaboratively across disciplines um, to address climate change? Because you know there's so many inter intersectional elements that impact people, and I'd love to get your thoughts about how we can break those silos. Great. Uh, thanks, Troy. Um, let me start with that latter one, because I, I mentioned this a moment ago, and this is a good place to um, uh, on which to elaborate. Uh, climate change is in part a scientific issue. It's in part a communication and behavioral issue, as we discussed. But 
fundamentally, it is an issue of management and leadership. That is at its core what grappling and contending with climate change will come down to. And, and that entails generating political will. It entails securing funding. It entails telling the story. It entails making sure the trajectory of where we are going, uh, both from a strategic perspective as well as an action perspective, is on track. And I, I really, truly do commend Governor Mills, as well as the city of Portland and South Portland, for taking a lead there. I mean, the the title of Maine's action climate action plan is Maine won't wait, uh, which is uh, which tells you where Maine is, and that's commendable. Uh, fundamentally, the future of our state's grappling, our state's um, uh, outcomes with respect to climate change, will not be because of any scientific articles that get published. It will be because of leadership. And so making sure our elected leaders understand the issue, are focused on the issue, and have the wherewithal to plan and take action is key. Now, that entails, in part, breaking down the silos that plague any large institution, government or non-government. Um, how you do that really matters. And I think the key, at least at CDC, is to make sure it's a priority from leadership at the top. This is an issue on which I'm focused. A number of my colleagues here at the CDC are focused, and that makes it a lot easier for it to live at a high level rather than down in the cockles of one aspect of CDC uh, and, and not getting the cross-agency attention it deserves. So these things are, here, here's the, the bottom line on that. Um, things like siloed versus cross-cutting, those are choices. Um, and those are choices that can be altered as the situation demands. And so to the extent that work on so that, that government is often siloed, that's a choice. And it's not a choice we have to agree to. It's a choice that can be changed. And uh, we've made some strides at CDC to do so, but there's a lot more to be done. Now, as to your former question uh, with respect to the education that folks received, it's varied. It's more of a feature of public health less of a feature of clinical medicine. But and at the same time, what clinicians are used to is understanding how disease rates are changing. And that very much impacts where they are. And that's a function of climate change. So there's more to do on both fronts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Penelope, I think you have your hand up next. Uh, hi. Um, thanks for taking our questions, Dr. Shaw. Um, now that you're in this national position. Um, can you help us put Maine in context as far as are there best practices around public health and climate change embraced in other states that we could be learning from here in Maine to tackle problems that we've either not yet resolved or issues we may not even be paying attention to yet? And likewise, are there climate impacted public health areas here in Maine where we might be leading the way? Great. Uh, thank you. That, that's a great question. I'm going to start with the, the latter of those two, which is what can the rest of the country learn from Maine? Because that's where we should start. That's where we should start any discussion. What can everyone else learn from us? And then we'll we'll see what we can learn from others, maybe if we have time. Um, here's here is what is a standout uh, to me about the work that Maine has done, staying within the climate and health lane. Uh, the first is um, We've already talked about this, but it's worth putting a fine point on um, a very deliberate focus on the impact of heat and climate change. Uh, so in, in other in another in a parallel universe, um, what leaders in that parallel universe of Maine are saying is, um, oh, you know, heat. Yeah, but, you know, cold is really the bigger thing. And, uh, you know, heat's going to be fine. It's only two or three days a year. And uh, it, it, let's worry about that later. That would be um, that that that's probably happening in some other parallel universe, but that's not what's happening in our universe in Maine. Uh, leaders have decided, no, this is a threat that's going to come at us and we need to take action now way well before it's too late. So that's one I would spotlight. The other is I, I want to give um, a, a shout out to my former colleagues at the Maine CDC, which is a lot of work understanding and getting a t getting a handle on a really difficult problem, which is tick-borne diseases. Again, we've talked about it. I think they've affected everyone in Maine that I know. They've affected me and my family. Um, being really deliberate in 
where the diseases are, how they're spreading through the data on the main CDC's website, being really action oriented in terms of what people can do, and then educating clinicians, because diagnosing these things is really hard. If you or one of your pets has ever had a tick-borne disease, again, as my family has, it's dizzying. Is it Lyme? Is it anaplasma? Is it Babesia? What are these things? So that clinician education is really critical. And I'm really pleased to see that Maine has taken the lead on both of those issues. Again, this is a function of leadership and management. And I, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to see that. The question is, where does that go in the future? Right now, we need to focus on action, and that's going to be the next phase of climate work. Now, uh, as to your former question, what is happening in other parts of the country where Maine could take a steer from? Um, I would say a, a newer element of climate change that is, is becoming more front and center is flooding. Um, even back when I was at the Maine CDC and working on these issues as part of the, the climate team, um, flooding was on our minds, but I, I, I don't think it was, um, I don't think it's had the, the, the front of mindness that it does now. And so uh, I suspect as with other coastal states, there is much that Maine can draw upon as we're improving our work there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You bet. I think we have time for one more question. If yeah. there's anyone from the audience. I can always ask a question too. Or Penelope, I see you just unmuted. Well, I was going to ask if you had time, could you follow up on the what you mean by the public health aspect of flooding? I mean, are we talking about just actually relocating people, figuring out how to reach them and get them out of harm's way? Or yeah. is it con uh, so, it's spin offs? Yeah. It's a couple of things. Uh, one is just what you noted, the acute phase of a response to flooding, which is how are folks going to get to where they need to go? Uh, and where is that going to be? And what's the plan to do all of that? So that's very much the emergency response phase, which public health has a role in, a very clear role. Um, but then as we get into the recovery aspects of flooding, again, something that CDC is very much engaged with, then you get questions about things like, well, what's the water quality going to be like if the water system has been waterlogged through the flooding? How are they going to be testing the water to make sure it's safe for consumption? How are they going to make sure that any contaminants have been appropriately flushed at every inch of the water delivery system? Um, things of that nature. There are other very acute phase things like rises in infectious diseases, uh, even fungal infections in people's homes because of the fact that their homes are waterlogged. And then you get into the recovery phase overall. So, so there's the acute phase, there, there's the response, which is when CDC is often on the ground, and then there, there's the recovery. And long-term consequences of flooding can do things like erode the quality of soil, which makes it that much more difficult for agricultural operations to continue, things of that nature. So it's, a, it's an arc of response that uh, Maine, I think, is now starting to experience, and we're definitely going to make sure we need to draw upon the lessons of other states. Perfect. Thank you. Um, any last questions? It's been just such a pleasure. Oh, yeah. Go for it, Councillor Bullitt. I guess I just have one last question and maybe you know, or maybe you don't, but um, at the Opportunity Alliance where I still run the WIC program and the SNAP-Ed program, um, I take registered dietitian and graduate students. And then sometimes I take public health interns as well. Um, and one of the things I do work really hard at is making sure that they understand the social determinants of health and like all the things you're saying right now, water quality, like the in built environment. And I'm wondering if you have any sense of the academic community like truly changing curriculums for these programs so that our students don't show up telling me they want, no offense, but like, you know, show, do a cooking demo about beet brownies or something. Mm -hmm. um, when what I really need them to understand is how important right water and, and built environment are. So I'm just wondering if you have any sense from the academic community of them, like making that fundamental shift for the public health um, instruction. Um, that's a great question. And I, I, I don't, I don't know is the, is the bottom line. I, certainly it's on the minds as an academic matter of members of the academic community um, who write about the issue, but you're asking a much more poignant question, which is how has curriculum changed to reflect that? 
and I don't know the answer. My hope is that it has indeed changed. One could, one should hope that, but I, I don't want to misrepresent uh, and tell you one way or the other. It's a great question. Um, we can we can try to follow up and both learn. Um, I think I think I'm gonna cancel off questions um, and just thank everyone for joining us today. Um, yeah, you took the time out of your day to join this wonderful conversation and a very special thank you to Dr. Shaw. Um, just such informative, I think, responses and just, yeah, a wonderful presentation at the beginning. Um, we're very lucky to have you today. Um, well, my pleasure, everyone. It's again, great to see all my old friends. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I miss Maine very, very much. Uh, hopefully one of these days, not too soon, I'll be back to being a full-time resident. But until then, I'm really delighted to be able to spend some time with you all. Thank you for taking some time out of your Friday morning to hang out and talk about climate change and public health and health. That tells you everything you need to know about people in Maine right there. Oh, thank you. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to do a last little plug. If you'd like to learn more about our climate action plan or subscribe to our monthly newsletter, or um, just stay stay in the know about future coffee and climates, head to oneclimatefuture.org. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody. And yeah, thank you, Dr. Shaw. I feel lucky. My mom's gonna be so excited. <laughs> it's, a, it's a and, problem. Thank and, you all. And, yeah. and I'll put a plug in for the Sustainability and Transportation Committee. So we meet the second Tuesday, uh, I mean, the second Wednesday um, of every month. Um, agendas are put up on the city website and we'd love to have anybody join us. Thank you again. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.